Shinji, crank that soldier boy. Hello! Welcome to the first episode of White Pill Wednesday. And today I'd like to start off with saying that uh, the silver price is $32. Silver's fantastic. Um, legally not an investment. I don't think I'm allowed to do those. Get in trouble. I don't know. Government silly. But I can tell you, I have a handful myself. I also have the ammunition and skills to back up the protection of my silver. Buy some silver. You know, it, it, inflation's getting really bad. Even my Mexican co-worker understands, yeah, inflation's getting really bad. And it, we're, we're just treading water. Dude, the, the money that I'm making right now, I'm... Hold it! Hey, you know what? I'm not going to talk about that because it's White Pill Wednesday. I'm going to talk about nice things. It's not always going to be nice things that you agree with, perhaps, but it's going to be things that make me feel nice, and I hope it makes you feel good as well. Starting off, we've got uh, space travel it is looking to get cheaper as NASA agreements to support work on commercial spacecraft and space stations. NASA partnerships announced 15th of June would support development of a new commercial capabilities that include Blue Origin crewed spacecraft and a Starship-derived space station from SpaceX. NASA announced the selection of seven companies for unfunded space act agreements as part of its collaborations for commercial space capabilities mark ii initiative nasa will provide the selected companies with technical expertise assessments and data in to assist the companies in the development of new capabilities the companies can leverage nasa's vast knowledge and experience and the agency can be a customer for the capabilities included in the agreements in the future phil McAllister, director of commercial space flight at nasa headquarters said in a statement about the selections what a run-on sentence Ultimately, these agreements will foster more competition for services and more providers' innovative space capabilities. My bad. NASA is not providing any funding to the companies under the agreements. The agency said in the announcement that offering its expertise to the companies requires only minimal government resources. Um, I believe it just goes on from there. But, I don't know about you, I really like space. I think space is a very cool thing. I We need to be a space-faring species. Moon base, when... Mars base, soon after, based on Titan, hopefully within our lifetimes. I know, crazy, right? With NASA working together with a uh, various assortment of other space agencies, that's going to be great, because that means that you and me, you know, the average working guy, will be able to see space within our lifetime. It might not be as cheap as an airplane ticket, but it will be for our grandchildren, guaranteed. Speaking of uh, space stuff, Vulcan performs first static fire test. The United Launch Alliance carried out a static fire test of its Vulcan Centaur rocket engine June 7th, one of the final milestones before the vehicle's first launch. A Vulcan rocket fired its two BE-4 engines in a static fire test called Flight Readiness Firing, FRF, at 9.05 Eastern from Cape Canaveral. The engine start sequence started at T-4.88 seconds, and ULA said in a statement an hour after the test, with the engines throttling up to their target level for two seconds before shutting down, that concluding the six second test. The test appeared to go as planned. Nominal run, Tori Bruno, president and chief executive of ULA, tweeted moments after the test. This is a huge milestone. This is as close as you can come to launching a rocket without actually launching the rocket. Mark Peller, vice president of Vulcan development at ULA, said on a company webcast shortly after the test. The test exercised all the vehicle and ground systems up through igniting, up through ignition of the engines, stopping just before releasing the rocket. That's our last major milestone on the path to launch, she said, so a big accomplishment. And this, I, I don't know anything about this Vulcan company, I'm going to look into it just a little bit more myself, hope, maybe, maybe they're public, maybe I can throw a couple of, couple of dollary dues at them, because I am very bullish on space. Space is, space is very cool. I like space, I like Star Trek, I like Stargate, I like Star Wars, I'm just, I, I like, I like space, what can I say? Having more companies and more uh, space agencies in in the running, that means more competition, they're going to be more competitive, and they're going to be looking to drive their prices down so that they're the uh, first pick option. Another thing that I find incredibly cool is guns. I am actually 18. And here we have FN's FS-2000 bullpup rifle in 5.56 NATO. Speaking of space, here we have a space gun. Written by Jeff Wood, fun with FN's FS-2000 bullpup rifle in 5.56 NATO. Now, I think bullpups, while a little over-engineered in some cases, and, you know, perhaps a bit of a novelty item. If you don't have a rifle, buy a regular AR-15, AK-47, whatever you please. But I think these are neat. These are really cool. I, I just think the idea of, you know, having a nice, short-looking gun. It's not actually... It's not actually six, uh, un under 16 inches or how however long this is. Because it has a full-length barrel in it. Because ha having a... Having a bullpup like this means that the entirety of the gunpowder will burn from the round that you fire. 
as opposed to short barreled rifles, which don't use the entirety of the gunpowder that per round. So I think they're really cool. I think they look like space guns. I like bullpups. So having another bullpup, especially from FN, who've done the uh, P90 in the past, which means that, you know, this guy is pretty much going to be the young brother of the P90, but chambered on 556, which I believe is a heavier round. I don't know why I don't work with 57 because I'm poor. <laughs> anyway, from Jeff Wood. In the unique world of bullpups, pretty much everybody knows each other. There are several popular bullpups on the market, and today we are reviewing one of the one of the popular from the recent past. The FN Herstal FS2000 bullpup was produced for almost 20 years and has been in service in various militaries across the world. If you don't know what a bullpup is, let's get that out of the way first. A bullpup firearm is one where the action is located behind the trigger versus in front of the trigger. The idea is to reduce the overall footprint of the weapon, but bullpups are often snubbed due to inherent complications of the design. Yes, they're very complicated. You have to get some ads. Like, look, look at this up here. Ain't that look neat? This looks neat too. This is this is the Springfield Hellion. And I if it was between the two, I think I'd go with the Hellion. Just because that carry handle looks Oh, looks so cool. Alright. The FS2000 is a 556 NATO carbine of carbine or carbine. Let me know in the comments. Designed for military and police use, the rifle uses a 17.5-inch barrel tucked deep into the bullpup chassis to shorten the platform. The gun uses Stanag pattern mags, but as far as I can tell, works with the metal GI type, which I hope just means stock standard AR-15 mags, because that's what I have, and I would like to use that. The action uses a short-stroke gas piston, a rotating bolt, and an interesting forward ejecting system to make this bullpup truly ambidextrous. With the action next to the face, it would be unpleasant to have brass ejecting out of the side if you are left-handed. The FS2000 has a unique look that has earned it several nicknames, such as the Tactical Tuna. Like the other FN bullpups, the P90, the FS2000 features an ambidextrous safety. A small disc is located at the bottom of the trigger guard and can be rotated from either side with the trigger finger in order to engage or disengage the safety. The charging handle is located on the front left side of the rifle and uses a claw detent to keep its place. Here it is. I, I, I could go on reading, reading more, but you, you get the picture. So it looks like it is still using the P90 uh, trigger system all down here. I've, I've seen that. I, I haven't used it. I would really like to. Um, it's got a solid rail up here for uh, Picatinny. And overall, good looking gun. Pl pl plenty of room here for you to slap your, your disgusting little anime girl Hi, stickers on. Daddy. And I... Um. Let me read the specs here. Barrel. 17.5 inches overall length 29.25 inches weight 7.9 pounds caliber 556 by 45 millimeter nato or 223 remington magazine 30 round detachable box magazine action semi-auto short stroke gas piston system with a rotating bolt barrel cold hammer forged chrome lined with ported muzzle brake controls left side charging handle with ambidextrous controls and the ejection is a unique forward firing system here we go. Let me, let me read some pros and cons and then we'll move on. Pros. Ambidextrous controls. Unique ejection pattern. Smooth and pleasant to shoot. And it's accurate. Cons. Bulky design. Awkward controls. Ejection pattern could cause possible malfunctions. And it fails to lock back on empty. It, it, it could be that it is just for military and police use. But if you can get your hands on one, that sure would be neat. Yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing anything in here about when it will be available if it will be available what the price range is so it, it could be that this is just you know designed for like one small french division which would suck because i think that's i think it's, it's a cool neat i don't think i can see myself playing yet if if they if there was a price on here then they would have listed and slash or where to like pre-order so moving on um i want to talk about another aspect of you know kind of guns is one of the three important things to being a modern day militiaman is having communications between you and your other buddies. And one of those ways that you can do communications, let me make sure that I'm not <laughs> accidentally doxing myself, that kind of suck, um, is with this, the Baofeng UV5R two-way radio for $19 reduce. Now it's not the best radio. There are better radios on the market, but for $19.73 plus shipping or free, if you got Amazon Prime, don't be poor. 
for as cheap as it is for starting, sure, go for it. It's 20 bucks. What else were you going to spend that 20 bucks on? A cheeseburger? Look, man, make the cheeseburger yourself. It'll be cheaper. It'll be better for you. No seed oils. Get yourself a radio. Play around with it. I don't have mine within reach. It's fun. Radios are fun. I like them. Violate FAA guidelines. They're nerds. Um, going along with uh, talking about malicious stuff, ATAC. If you don't know what ATAC is, imagine the Call of Duty minimap, but on your person. It, it's just, it, you mount it right on top of your rig. So, an ATAC system is, it's a phone that contains topographical information, weather information, and um, if you have buddies who have it, you can also find out where your buddies are. You can, all, like, you, you can draw. It's, it's really cool. I don't entirely understand it myself. It's fun to mess around with. I, I have a, I have a Google Pixel right here that I'm going to run graphene on and probably tomorrow. It's going to be really neat. It's super cool. The guy who put it together, Doomer Tapes, I've, I've interacted with him a handful of times on Twitter.com. He's really cool. Check out the link up here. And, uh, yeah, just, just, just be a better, be a better militiaman. The Founding Fathers imagined every single man being a rifleman. At the drop of a hat, every man would pick up his rifle, meet with his meet with his friends and neighbors, and they would defend their area from the Redcoats. Who are the Redcoats today? Well, depends on what you and your buddies think. Uh, one of the people who I would say are the Redcoats is uh, Oregon, particularly Portland, Oregon, right about here-ish. That's why I want to talk about Greater Idaho. So the Greater Idaho movement, uh, today they, they wanted to report that the ballot in uh, Crook County avoids is uh, is now. In Greater Idaho news, the vote for Greater Idaho is on the ballot in Crook County, and well as avoiding a felonious recount in Walla Walla. I think that's how it's pronounced. Wallowa. I don't know. It's, it's Pacific Northwest. You lads are nuts. So, as you can see, this is Greater Idaho, so regular Idaho, and what the Greater Idaho movement is, is it's trying to gather all of these little lads here to vote to leave Oregon. Because Oregon, particularly Portland, is completely infringing upon the rest of Oregon, who is normal. You, you know how you, you think of, like, the, the super annoying liberal Oregonian? That's a Portlander. Maybe Eugene. So, seeing Oregon lose some of its power to Idaho is fantastic. I love seeing it. And I hope we start seeing a lot more of these, like, boundary redrawings in the near Because that's what we have them for. Um... Let me read some of the art. The Wooloa County Clerk stated last night that the Greater Idaho ballot measure has avoided a recount because the election results were not close enough to trigger a recount. Yesterday was the last day that Oregon voters could cure their incomplete ballots. Greater Idaho ballot measures now have a perfect record in Eastern Oregon. Oh, that's great. The Crook County Court voted this morning to place a non-binding question about the Greater Idaho proposal on the county's May 2024 ballot. The question is, should Crook County represent that its citizens support efforts to move the Idaho state border to include Crook County? The ballot summary states, the Crook County Court has placed this advisory question on the ballot to determine voter attitudes of whether your Crook County elected officials should inform state and federal officials that the people of Crook County supported and continued negotiations regarding a potential relocation of the Oregon-Idaho border to include Crook County. The question is similar to questions approved by Wheeler County and Sherman County voters. Crook County will be the 13th county to vote on the proposal. Umatilla and Gilliam voter counties are the only counties that are included in the proposal but have not yet put the issue to their voters. Some counties of Oregon are governed by a county court composed of a judge and two county commissioners rather than a board of commissioners. The Greater Idaho Movement believes that the state leaders should want to let Oregon join Idaho because it would benefit Oregon state budget because Eastern Oregon state senators have announced that they will block votes in the Oregon Senate indefinitely until the state leadership changes course, as their new op-ed explains. The author, Mike McCarter, wrote that moving the state line would be good for the income taxes of both states. Portland metro incomes are so high that any middle income county that departs the state Oregon state budget increases the average income of both Oregon and Idaho. That's really cool. This is probably the best way to do it because people in both Oregon and Idaho are pissed with the lack of representation because that's such an important thing nowadays um, in their government. That That's the important thing. It is much better for the interest of both Oregon as well as the people of Eastern Oregon, which are very normal. I, I, I love spending my time down there. You want them to vote to leave and join Idaho? Then just start 
avoiding taxes and violating YouTube community guidelines. <laughs> And for my rumble bros, just start shooting at state officials because they don't think they're, they're not part of you. They're not your guys. They are a foreign adversarial force who are ruling over rural Oregon illegitimately. Okay. Well, I believe we've recorded for long enough. Um, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a good rest of your day. And remember, Wednesday is for white pills. And we say bye bye.